Living in paradise was just so stressful today. But you always know just what to do. I know we were just creative, but I feel like we've known each other forever. You know, like all seven days. I know. I'm just so comfortable around you. What are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you just said oh. I... Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh, this Ooh. is all my fault. Listen, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's fine. It's just... Seemed like God wanted us to start the human race, so I was thinking that I'd do what God wanted. I know, so. I'm sorry. If you think I led you on, I, I just don't see us like that. Well, but we're made for each other, so... Oh, that's so sweet! No, I mean, literally, you were made from a rib that was taken from me, so... And that's why uh, we make such good friends, and I don't think we should ruin that with sex. But, but we don't know what sex is yet. I mean, sex could be awesome, and I... But why take the risk? Okay, hypothetically, let's say I'm the last man on Earth, then... Adam, I, I just got out of a really long relationship, and I want to keep my options open because there's just... Sup? <gasps> hey, baby, I missed you! Oh, whatever. I'm going over the uh, tree of knowledge. You coming? Huh? Sorry. Well, we'll skip stones or something later, okay? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I have tons of animals to name, too, so I'm going to be super, super busy. <gasps> oh, bro, forget her. We can fix this right now. Let me grab another one of those ribs. No, I'm fine. We'll make it work. <laughs> you sure? Nope, totally cool. Cool. Hi, welcome to Darkwood Brew. I'm Eric Elms, your host, and Darkwood Brew is that place where we combine ancient Christian mystical practice with modern interactive web technology, world-class jazz, arts, biblical scholarship, guests who join us from around the world, and, well, you never know exactly what's going to happen. You're, uh, you've just located yourself at part two of our series, Failing, Falling, and Flying, uh, Genesis Stories of Original Grace. Many people look at the opening chapters of Genesis and form whole uh, theologies of salvation based on what they see in those opening creation accounts. Some look at those opening chapters and see original sin and build a theology based on God's wrath that needs to be uh, overcome by the death of Christ, lest we all burn in hell for eternity. Others look to those uh, stories in Genesis uh, and see original blessing and a creation that God would never destroy, no matter how bad it got. Is it original blessing, original sin, or something else entirely going on there? Well, we'll be exploring that with the story of Adam and Eve and the fall. Uh, joining us this evening, uh, coming to us from the, Darkwood, uh, from the Darkwood Brew Festival, from the Wild Goose Festival in Corvallis, Oregon, is someone we've been trying to get on the program for a long time, but she has a church service that meets at the same time in Denver. That's the Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber. She's got some great things to say. We uh, pre-recorded her interview at the Wild Goose uh, uh, a couple days ago, and um, you're in for a, a real treat as we unpack the wisdom of a very ancient and yet mysterious story. Well, bef before we be going any further, let's take a look at what happened uh, last week. And I think what we're trying to say to your question about hell and all these other things is who is this God? Because if you get that wrong, everything's wrong. Our whole theological system has been boiled down to a hell avoidance plan. The whole concept of hell is really used to terrorize people into the faith. How do I get you to do what I want you to do? Well, if you don't conform, don't worry just about what I'll do to you in this lifetime. God hates you too, and he'll punish you, wait a minute, for how long? Forever! Yeah, you know, hey, that reminds me, have, have you ever been in a position where you actually overhear the conversation of somebody speaking on the phone, you try to figure out what the heck they're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, I think that you're right. That is kind of like reading the Bible <laughs> sometimes. I mean, you, you kind of, it feels a bit like a conversation that somebody's having with somebody else, and sometimes a bit hard to... Uh, to dissect exactly what's going on. Anselm will say that if you commit a uh, finite evil, a finite crime against an infinite being, it requires an infinite punishment, which I, I like to facetiously say, yeah, well, if you commit a crime against an infinitely loving God, I guess that also requires an infinitely loving punishment. I would return to the Genesis account and say, do we see any evidence of that in these words, or are they actually trying to show something else? Do you think that we as human beings need to um, conceive of God as violent in that way? I think it represents a supreme failure of imagination because we can't imagine that God could be anything other than what we are. 
and that we order our societies like the logos of human society outside of Christ, I believe, is violence. That is the organizing principle of humanity. This is why I think John, the book of John, is, is it, it begins again with introducing a new law, logos, which is a new organizing principle. And instead of scapegoating violence and death, it's going to be self-giving love and forgiveness. It's going to be a victim who comes back from the dead, not to wreak vengeance as Abel wanted in, in Genesis, but to, to forgive like Joseph in the Old Testament. And then this becomes the foundation for an utterly new way of living. You know, that piece we open with every week is called uh, The Call of the Dark Wood by Chuck Moronic. And many people have asked us uh, over time, uh, where does the, the, the name Dark Wood Brew come from anyway? Well, that uh, Dark Wood is, is really a uh, nod back to the ancient uh, tradition of the Dark Wood that Dante actually got us all afraid of when he said, you know, in the middle of my life I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost, who saw the dark wood as a place of scary evil monsters that if, where if you stay there for too long it will only lead you to the gates of hell. Well, uh, that's not what we're thinking about the dark wood. Rather, we are picking up on the mystical tradition in Christianity, which always saw the dark wood a bit differently. It's a place uh, oftentimes that we enter not of our own accord, uh, we enter it through lostness, failure, uh, uncertainty, um, emptiness, these kinds of things. But the longer we spend in the dark wood, the more we, we come to realize that uh, there is a presence in the darkness uh, for whom darkness is not dark at all. Uh, there are strange gifts in that dark wood, indeed even the presence of God. Sometimes um, you are never more found than when you first realize uh, you are lost in that dark wood. And the dark wood is not, therefore, uh, simply a place of, of darkness and shadow, but also a place where you can find uh, points of light, even perhaps alehouses in the dark wood, where people who have uh, let go of their certainties and, and stepped into the mystery uh, find each other and seek camaraderie as fellow travelers. Uh, Darkwood Brew on the internet is, in a sense, one of those ale houses. Uh, what we serve here may not uh, get you drunk, uh, but it may get you high in a, in a certain respect. Um, another place where we find the dark wood uh, gatherings uh, happening with, um, and, and the real joy that is found in the dark wood right now is at the Wild Goose Festival. The Wild Goose Festival started last year in Shakori Hills, North Carolina, and has quickly grown to a real national presence in the emerging frontier of what might be called convergence uh, Christianity. Darkwood Brew Festival um, became so popular this year in Shakori Hills that, that uh, due to popular demand, they opened up another West, a West Coast version in Corvallis, Oregon, which has been meeting uh, this weekend. And I put out a call yesterday on Facebook, hey, anybody got some photographs uh, from the Wild Goose? And uh, Bill Dahl uh, was kind enough to um, share a number of, just to give you a little, little um, 
uh, kind of an overview of what, what's going on there, um, the, this gathering. It's really a gathering of people who are, uh, have, kind of are seeking Christianity in a new way beyond what might be called traditional um, evangelicalism and also traditional liberalism. Uh, I like to think of them as, as post-evangelicals and, and post-liberal uh, progressives. As we see photographs from the Wild Goose, we see a number of folks that, uh, like Steve Knight here, who are have been uh, previous Skype guests on Darkwood Brew. Uh, Steve, and there's uh, Brian McLaren, there's uh, Gareth Higgins and Mike Morell, who are both also um, uh, big organizers of the festival. There's Christian Pyatt, who's also been a Skype guest, uh, trying to avoid the camera. <laughs> and uh, hopefully sh future Skype guest, Bruce Reyes Chow in the center there. He was uh, actually in Atlanta with me uh, a couple weeks ago. I met him for the very first time. But all kinds, I mean, just the, the faces um, really tell more of the story than I can. There is a new thing going on um, within Christianity, and it is making people very, very exciting, excited. They are letting go of the certainties uh, that sometimes uh, the, uh, Christians have had, either on the evangelical or liberal side, and are truly stepping into mystery, and not simply finding um, a vacuum, <laughs> but a presence. Now, I don't know what exactly they're doing there. Uh, I, I, I did hear that perhaps they're worshiping Gareth Higgins there. I'm not positive about that, but, um, but uh, we'll, we'll check into that. Uh, there's uh, Trip Fuller and, and his band Trip with the uh, home-brewed Christianity. Um, but really, and I don't know what that this is. I have no idea what that means <laughs> at all. But, uh, you know, we see, a, uh, the, the, like I say, the faces tell it all. And also the, the faces also show the presence of quite a lot of children, which was also, um, the children were present uh, in huge numbers at this last year's uh, festival in um, Shikori Hills as well. Truly attracting um, all ages, all uh, uh, genders, uh, sexual orientation, uh, races, nationalities, um, cultures. Um, it's truly, um, it looks like a, truly a Pentecost community gathering and uh, we, we are glad to be supporters of the Wild Goose and uh, look forward to seeing you there at a future festival. Uh, we've said that if they have six Wild Goose festivals next year, um, we'll be at all six. But uh, one of the things that where you, you, that's unique to the Wild Goose is that it is really probably the preeminent example of what might be called convergence Christianity. These, these folks who have left um, both, you know, kind of the, the Christianity of their native traditions and have been wandering in the wilderness and are just now starting to find each other and really have a great time uh, when they do. Um, this last week we asked uh, Nadia um, Bowles-Weber about uh, Christianity as she founds it, finds it in Denver and uh, she spoke about Convergence Christianity um, this way. I'm really blessed to have, uh, I play well with others, so I, I have my ELCA clergy. I actually have a tech study every Tuesday that I started of just Lutheran clergy, and we study the lectionary text together, and I absolutely cherish those relationships. Those guys are like geniuses, really great theologians. But also, I have a lot of uh, friends who are more progressive evangelicals. I, I had the, um, the honor of being in a clergy group. We met for a few hours every month for six months. And I was the only mainline Protestant clergy person in the group, so it's all evangelicals and Pentecostals, and they weren't even progressives. I mean, they were just these other clergy in Denver, and um, and I just I, I ended up feeling really schooled actually because um, my denomination we talk about being kind of social justice church, you know, and we're, we're really about social justice, and and I got a tour around Denver and see what these evangelicals and Pentecostals were doing in terms of being in ministry among the poor in Denver, and I just felt schooled by that. I mean, I learned a lot. And I feel like what I, one, one way in which, I mean, I come from a more conservative background. I was raised Church of Christ. So I think uh, progressive evangelicals we're, aren't afraid to talk about Jesus and the Bible in, in ways that are really, um, that are really connected to their heart. And I think sometimes mainline Protestants have a hard time doing that because we don't want to sound like those kind of Christians. And so sometimes we can kind of jettison Jesus and the Bible, which, let's be honest, are the only two things we actually have going for us. <laughs> so um, I think that sort of coalition building among um, more mainline Protestants and progressive evangelicals feels like a really, really logical bridge to be building.
Wow, I wonder what would have, would, how the story would have been different if they would have been tempted by eating the snake rather than the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I was just thinking, I don't remember the story going quite like that, but <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that right. would have made a big difference, wouldn't it? That's right. Well, temptation was the uh, subject of our question of the week, I understand, it it on Facebook. Yes, it was just plain what tempts you. And we got lots of different responses. I guess it's a, it's a um, popular thing to be tempted. <laughs> But the, I, as I was reading through them, I found like three different categories that we're working with. Some people are tempted, they say, by uh, different ways of being in the world, so to speak. Like uh, Rondell Miller says that sometimes she is tempted to be angry at other Christians on their way that they treat people. Uh, Kathy Cameron says the need to be right. Hmm. That's something that tempts me quite a bit. Of course, I usually am. But. Uh, you no, know, you're wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> Judging others, uh, busyness, taking on too much, hmm. shortcuts and letting someone else handle what I should be doing, those kinds of things. Things that are easy, taking the easy way out, that's kind of like the shortcut. I'm still waiting for you to list something that I'm tempted by. Yeah, none of that. None of that. <laughs> Getting away from the election year, rhetoric. <laughs> Amen. Yay, Amen. Oh, please. Go. Lord, and, come. <laughs> and Mark Davis, of course, says, my own, in my own mind is a perpetual factory of idols and vain imaginations. Oh, so. great. Mark Davis is actually going to be coming to uh, Omaha, and we'll be streaming him uh, live um, from the Center for Faith Studies. Mm -hmm. I was talking about, uh, what's the subject? The uh, Left Behind left and Loving It, loving it. Uh, a cheeky look at the rapture. So um, yeah. we'll have more information about that shortly, but he's coming out, I think, on September 13th. Yeah. And so, so Thursday night, yep. yeah. So And we'll be streaming that. Uh, so if you care to join us for that, we'll give you more information later. Yeah. Um, another side of this whole question about temptation is that idea of emotion, emotions that are brought out by mm. um, vulnerability. Mm. Uh, the idea of being bored. And when you're bored, you tend to be tempted by things that you shouldn't be tempted by. Um, when you're lonely or when you don't feel good about yourself or you're hearing other voices inside your head other than God. So mm. they're telling you you're not quite what you ought to be or what God created you to be. So that's part of it. Um, another section of it, of course, were food and things like that. <laughs> and food is my favorite. That's what I'm tempted by Absolutely. most. We had ice cream. Is that one of yours? That's one a huge mine. one of mine. Huge one of mine. A huge one. Chocolate, Starbucks, Pop-Tarts. Okay, you haven't listed something that I'm not tempted by yet. <laughs> the, the latest temp technology. I'm extremely tempted by that, too. Yes, yes. Yeah. You who had four phones when they first came out. And um, Scott Fredrickson, of course, says, anything that's not mine is what tempts me. <laughs> says it all right there. That Absolutely. does kind of say it all. Sums yeah. it up. Wow. Those are a great, great list. We really appreciate it when you uh, give us feedback on, on Facebook. We're in communication with our viewership um, all week long. So if you haven't been out to the Facebook page, um, get on it and join the conversation. You know, one of the things I want to announce tonight, uh, this is a, a, we don't typically talk, talk about um, Darkwood Brew uh, viewership, 
but we hit a milestone um, this last month. Now, I'm actually forbidden from speaking about actual numbers because the philosophy here is that a number, uh, we don't want to simply have our credibility be, um, be based on a number like, oh my God, they have so many people coming, they must be good. <laughs> um, so I can't give actual numbers, but I will say that we, we broke um, all, we blew away all viewership records for the entire time we've been on, um, on the internet um, this last month. And uh, congratulations to all the 50 volunteers who make Darkwood Brew uh, possible and, and the staff, uh, it was a quite, quite a, a milestone. And we start looking into where um, the viewers are, are coming from and you'll never guess, uh, well, of course, the United States is, is where we get most of our, our viewership, Canada being num number two, Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you, many people would not guess the number three country where Darkwood Brew um, viewership is coming from currently. Now, it hasn't been all, all, all this time, but uh, currently, uh, many people guess Australia, which is a good guess because they are in number four position. Uh, many people guess Great Britain. That's a gr another good one. Uh, Germany, uh, that's a good one, too. In fact, next week's Skype guest will be coming from Germany live. Uh, but no. Uh, it's China. China is the number three viewership of, of Darkwood Brew right now. So um, welcome if you're joining us uh, from China. Special welcome for you. And obviously, people are spreading the news in China uh, right now. And we really appreciate um, you are giving us a shout out there. And uh, uh, look forward to you join us live one of these days. But I think the time zone is a little bit uh, diff yeah. difficult for that one. Yeah. <laughs> so. But you never know. Absolutely. Spirit moves. Absolutely. But it's just nice to see the word is getting out uh, and that uh, people are, are finding Darkwood Brew. Our most common feedback is uh, it's a safe harbor to explore uh, questions and to really embrace that mystery of life, um, and moving kind of beyond certainty, but not into something that's just simply vacuous and empty, but more, um, I would say, actually into um, a level of trust in, in, uh, within mystery rather than certainty. Well, uh, we are going to our central passage this evening, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, is uh, Genesis 2 and 3, the story of, of Adam and Eve. Now, last week we covered this, uh, the first creation account in Genesis. Did you know there are two? Um, there are two distinctly different creation accounts in Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, the first one was written during the great exile in Babylon in the 6th century, um, written during a time when Israel was just down and out. It was the most devastating period of the entire uh, biblical history. And curiously, um, we found that, um, just as you found, saw in the highlights, if you missed it last week, um, it's a, listening to Genesis 1 is kind of like hearing a one-sided phone, telephone conversation. Um, you may think you kind of get it, but it, there's also this kind of mystery there. Um, but in the recent um, century or so, scholars have been able to provide us with a lot of that other part of the conversation. Um, Genesis 1 was largely in conversation with the Babylonian creation account the, called the Enuma Elish. And we find many similarities between Genesis 1 and the Enuma Elish, but more importantly, we see many, uh, a few distinct differences. And what we found uh, was in contrast to the Babylonian creation account, which which saw creation and the ordering of chaos taking place through violence and humanity being uh, created through the blood of an evil god that was slain by the others and humanity's purpose being to serve as slaves of the gods. The Hebrews um, talked about creation uh, coming through the effortless word of God. It's not violent. You know, and in a time of exile, and the time of exile in our own lives, oftentimes it's helpful to realize and to remember that chaos... Uh, which seems so close and upfront and personal, um, isn't ordered through violence, but rather uh, through God's word. And since God's word is close, as close as our next breath, sometimes it just take, takes a moment of listening, uh, paying attention, uh, hearing that new word that brings reality into focus. But they also asserted that uh, we are created not uh, with the blood of an evil God, but in the very image and likeness of God. This was royal imagery. The Babylonians considered the only people that were worthy of calling, being called the image or likeness of God were uh, kings or uh, emperors. Uh, but Genesis says we're all uh, created in God's image and likeness, Genesis 1. Now Genesis 2 will say, have a few other things to say. Um, and then in contrast to the Babylonian account, uh, Genesis 1 talks about uh, not God as an enslaver, 
but as a liberator, one who gives us dominion over the earth, which is a kind of a problematic phrase these days as we kind of run, run roughshod over creation. But in a time when Israel had been beaten severely down and had no power, uh, to, to assert that we have dominion was to say, you know, you've been li you are not enslaved. You know, you've been liberated and empowered. You live as co-creators with God. It was a piece of fundamentally good news. But it's also, if taken on its own, Genesis 1 is fundamentally naive. If taken on its own, because all we need to do is look at the newspapers every day, and it tells us a diff that there's something more to human nature than simply being created in God's image and likeness. It's not just warm and fuzzy. And that's where Genesis 2 comes in, uh, with the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2 and 3, um, that, that, that account, the second creation account, actually was written in time four centuries earlier. It comes second, but it was written four centuries earlier during the height of Israel's power and confidence. It was during the 10th century that we have kings you may have heard of, like King David, King Solomon. The Book of Kings tells us that it was during that time that Israel's borders expanded far beyond what they had ever been and had ever been since. Uh, Israel was, was riding high. It was, for the first and only time of it in its history, a completely united people uh, with strong king, uh, a leadership. Yet it was during this time of high confidence and power that the Genesis 2 accounts, account talks about humanity as uh, frail, as created from the dust of the earth, as uh, being rather fickle and choosing to disobey God as soon as God has given them uh, paradise. Kind of ironic that, that in, the, in the lowest point of, of Israel's history, uh, Israel... Uh, Create, uh, spoke of humanity in the highest terms. And in the highest point in Israel's history, they spoke of humanity uh, in the lowest terms. That was, so it was their own people who were on the other end of that phone uh, when, when Genesis 2 and 3 were created, was created. But if we see it in the right light and, and dig a little deeper, as Nadia Bowles-Weber will help us do, you may just find that Genesis 2 and 3 is not simply bad news about our original sin. But perhaps Genesis 2 and 3 is even better news uh, than we ever expected. We'll be coming to that. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, Nadia Bowles-Weber um, at the Wild Goose Festival. Nadia, thanks for joining us on Darkwood Brew. Sure. Live here at Wild Goose. First, we'd just like to hear a little bit more about yourself. Well, I'm a pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I pastor a church in Denver called House for All Sinners and Saints. And it's a church I started about four years ago uh, with eight people out of my living room. Now it's probably, we have close to 200 people, probably 185 folks. And we worship every Sunday night in an Episcopal parish hall in Denver. And not a lot of Lutherans in my church, maybe 20% are Lutherans. A lot of people who come from sort of a post-evangelical or post-Pentecostal background, uh, former Roman Catholics, a lot of unchurched folks, people who have no Christian background at all. And we have a, actually a few nice Lutherans too, for good measure. You're not the general stereotype we expect from a Lutheran pastor. You're kind of covered in tattoos. I've heard that you have a wonderful mouth for cuss words and <laughs> other choice language. How do you reconcile that with your parish and being a pastor? Well, the great thing when you just start a church from scratch is people just know what they're getting into from the beginning. So I, I didn't have to go into a like really traditional parish as their new pastor and tone everything down and wear long sleeve shirts and watch what I say. It was really important to me that I, I wanted to start a church where I could authentically be the same person in every situation in my life. I'm the same person at church as I am at home, as I am when people see me out and about, as I am here at a festival. I'm just me and it was really important to me that, um, that we could all be part of a Christian community where we didn't have to bracket out parts of ourselves in order to be in fellowship with each other. And I think I sort of started that being myself and then that sort of created a space where other people felt okay really just being who they were at church. 
and um, that's actually something people talk about a lot like that's why they're there they can just completely be themselves and it's not like oh a bunch of tattooed uh, like foul-mouthed people get to be themselves at a church there's every kind of person there I mean we have we have elected officials next to ex-convicts, next to soccer moms, next to aging hipsters, transgender folks, uh, gay and lesbian folks. I mean, you walk in on Sundays and you look around and you go, I am unclear what all these people have in common. But one thing they have in common is they're all just uh, in a place where they're comfortable enough being themselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about what brought you here and what you're going to be talking to us all about? Uh, investment banking. Excellent. No, I am. Um, I'm doing a talk called uh, "The Authority of Failure," um, sort of uh, talking about what's the locus of authority in postmodern Christian communities, and how I feel like, at least in my ministry, one of the things that allows a group of people who have actually a really strong suspicion they're very suspicious of institutions and they're very suspicious of presumed authority and yet they allow me to be their pastor and I think one of the reasons is because um, I actually really don't I don't have a lot of fear about just admitting when I screw up and if I made a bad call or if I was um, maybe I wasn't honest about something I mean I, I just it doesn't bother me I don't spend much time defending or protecting my authority by trying to appear like I'm a better Christian than I am or that I'm better at my job than I am and so I just I just tell people look that was a bad call that was completely my fault forgive me I actually ask forgiveness for for, for messing up and I think somehow that opens this space where people are, are allowed to extend each other grace more readily and so Nobody really spends a lot of time in my church like wondering uh, if, if I'm for real or, um, you know, like I said, I'm consistently the same person in every situation that they see me in and that allows them to trust me more. And I'm really, I'm very forthcoming about my, what my shortcomings are and so um, somehow that allows them to give me authority in a strange way. And there have been times where, you know, actually most, a lot of the stuff I write, the stuff in my sermons and the talks I give, all my best stuff is stuff that makes me look bad. I mean, almost every great story I have is like, here's a great story about me being a complete ass. And like, this is how God's grace is revealed is in like, you know, God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And if we don't allow ourselves to admit that that space exists, we, how do we actually show God's grace to others? So I think that's pretty, you know, I haven't actually written my talk, but I think that's, <laughs> I think that's what it is. God is going to start commenting on uh, Genesis 2 and 3 specifically uh, next, but uh, she makes an interesting point there that I find helpful in applying to that, the, this story of Adam and Eve. She says uh, about her own ministry that that her authority comes oftentimes from saying, you know, look at when I've been a complete ass, and, and yet so people can relate uh, to that. You know, if we took to look at, take a look at Genesis 2 and 3 and the story of Adam and Eve, if we didn't overlay it with a whole lot of Christian theology, which over centuries has suggested that what happened there made God so infinitely angry at us that God's wrath could not be placated unless God killed God's own son, lest we burn in hell for all of eternity. If we were to take off that overlay and actually listen to the story on its own terms, in its own integrity, um, we find um, wisdom very much like Nadia uh, points to. A couple that looks, um, well, quite frankly, very much like ourselves who falls into a temptation, well, kind of like we do. If you look at the, the story of the serpent and the temptation, the serpent tempts that couple uh, by helping, the, or helping divert their attention away from what they have to what they lack. Oh, you can't eat from this tree? Diverting their attention from all the trees they could eat, eat from to the very two trees that they have no business eating from. But it goes a step further. Once he's got them hooked on that, that particular lack in the external world, the serpent turns it internally and says, you know, if you eat this fruit, uh, you'll, your eyes will be opened and you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. What? There's some, some knowledge that we, we don't have? Well, we're, we're dwelling in this great paradise with, with God. We, how could we be in God's presence if we don't even know right from wrong? Well, we, we, better get, we better get to it. We better be eating this fruit lest we uh, fail somehow in God's eyes to not know what we're doing. Yeah. 
And suddenly, you know, once we fall into that trap, assessing our own worthiness, you know, are we worthy to be in God's presence or are we not? Are we righteous enough or are we not? Are we good enough or are we not? Our attention goes from God to ourselves and we obsess on ourselves, completely ignoring the fact that this life isn't about us. It's about God. Let's go back to Nadia. This week we're talking about the story from Genesis 3 of the Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, could you tell us more about how you see that story? Well, I preached on this text recently and, um, and I, love, I love being able to preach on texts that people already have really set ideas about what they're about. Because it's always an opportunity to try and crack it open and, and see a, a deeper level of meaning. And because to me the Bible is this, it's an end, endless reservoir of meaning and we just keep going down and down and down and for each context it's read in, with each people who gather around it, there's going to be meaning. It doesn't mean it's always going to be the same. So I love getting my hands on a text that everyone feels like they already know what it's about. So I struggled with that because I know that people think, okay, well, I mean, I was raised thinking, all right, well, this, this story is about how God set up this really idyllic situation for humanity. It was like primeval club med, right? I mean, it was just perfect. It's all-inclusive resort, basically. And there was only really one rule. And the one rule was that you couldn't eat from this tree, right? So set up a situation where there's this rule and the whole thing was God will know that you love him and God will be happy if you don't break God's completely arbitrary rules and so uh, Eve decided to break the rule and now original sin is like a sexually transmitted disease it's now passed from every generation and we um, and we uh, have a difficult life as a result of a bad choice that this original chick made and so it's a setup for humanity and it feels like I don't know it doesn't feel like that's the God that is revealed in Jesus Christ. So I always feel as a Lutheran, we have this approach to the biblical text where we say the gospel is the canon within the canon. So we let scripture interpret scripture. And the lens that we always use is the gospel. How did God choose to reveal God's self in Jesus Christ? That's that's what we can sort of reliably know about God. Everything else is slightly, it's a little bit more conjecture. So. I look at that text and I go, well that doesn't feel like the God revealed in Christ. And so I started looking at it and going, well maybe, you know, you look at Bonhoeffer, he wrote this great, you know, book about this and he's like, I think original sin isn't, it, it was really choosing knowledge of good and evil over knowledge of God right? Like we put ourselves at the center and what we'd rather have is a list of good and bad so that we can know good and bad rather than knowing God. And it's almost like this dualistic thinking is what the, that original sort of curse is, being bound to having to be God now and making all the decisions about right and wrong. How would you encourage your listeners or your parishioners to move beyond those traditions? look at it that way. Well, one thing is actually looking a lot more critically at the text because a lot of times we think we know what's in there and if you look very closely, a lot of that stuff's made up. Like, there's no mention of sin in Genesis 3. There's no mention of uh, disobedience. There's, there's no apple. And it's like we have generations of Christian art that has, you know, a tree and a snake and a red delicious. And we just make these assumptions about the text. And if you really go back and look at it, one of the things that I, I sort of discovered when I went back and dug into Genesis 3 is the fact that when, um, when they were hiding from God and God says, where are you? And they're like, we're hiding from you because we're naked. God says back, who told you you were naked? And to me, that's like, wait, wait a minute, that shame that they were experiencing, that was not from God. And Genesis, if anything else, is an origin story. Every society has an origin story. And it tells us where, you know, humanity came from and why snakes don't have legs. And, you know, every society has origin stories. But this is also an origin story about shame. And shame has an origin. It's not God. 
That snake, whatever that represents to us, evil, uh, demonic forces, the devil, darkness, whatever that snake represents, that's the origin of shame. There were lies that that, that that darkness told them, and they started listening to that rather than God. And God goes, wait a minute, who told you you were naked? So it, it became this, this thing about there, is, there are origins of these things in our lives and sometimes to peel them back is really critical and you can only do it by actually really looking at the text again. How do we discern and figure out where God's voice is amidst the lies? I think that you can only do it by having shared sacred space with other people. I mean, I think there's a certain quieting of other voices that happens in the liturgy, for instance, um, that uh, is critical to us knowing where certain messages come from. It's really hard to tease it apart. And sometimes when you only have an hour of your week where you're quiet enough in a community of people gathered around the Word and gathered around the sacraments, when you only have an hour of that and countless other hours during the week where every other message is entering that's I mean you're competing pretty hard there for something really significant to overcome those other messages during the week and that's I mean that's one of the challenges that Christian community uh, faces all the time and as a preacher I mean one of the messages in my sermons a lot is like you know the waters of grace that covered you in your baptism are just simply the only thing that going to tell you who you are everything else is going to try and tell you who you are and it doesn't get to and like to be able to hear that is, um, is really critical to living as people who experience death and resurrection, to people, people who are a new creation. You have to constantly hear that. You have to constantly hear that you are not the sum total of the bad things you've done. You're also not the sum total of the good things you've done, right? You're, or what's your origin story? I mean, that's what gathering in, I mean, for me as a liturgical, sacramental Lutheran, gathering in a community, that's so much a part of that. What's your origin story? Who gets to name you and claim you? It's only God. And we have to remind each other of that just constantly in Christian community. Wise words indeed. We appreciate you, uh, Nadia, for uh, uh, coming on Darkwood Brew uh, this evening and sharing uh, your insights. Um, we are going to continue this episode with your insights on the creation account in Genesis 2 and 3 uh, by looking at um, the second half of the story, the part we haven't gotten to uh, yet, the part where um, after that eating of the fruit, um, they, and uh, you, God then says, well, here are the consequences uh, of, of doing that. Every week at Darkwood Brew, we focus on a particular text um, in a practice we call Numa Divina, which is based on the ancient Lectio Divina, where we read the passage a couple of times, and we're going to put that up on the screen, and you'll also hear it, and we ask you to simply find that verse that, um, that stands out for you, that, that kind of lifts you in some way, uh, the energy. Um, the, the, what the passage we'll be going over is Genesis 3, verses 14 through 24. If you want to follow along in a Bible, that you're more than welcome to, but we will have that up on the, te on the screen as well. For you in the coffee house, we'll ask you to, to uh, write down the, the verse number on your NUMA sheets. And for you online, we invite you to, um, to indicate the verse that, that raised the energy for you in our online poll that Morris, our, our uh, social media director, will be uh, putting up a uh, moment there uh, right now. So um, let us hear now uh, Genesis 3, verses 14 through 24, a very strange uh, text, but one that, um, well, there's a lot going on below the surface. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, 
I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you are returned to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, we invite you to uh, indicate uh, that verse that arose for you on, uh, on the online poll. We're going to be taking that in just a moment. I want to give you time to, to enter that. Uh, but before we, we, we ask Morris for what the poll results are, we uh, want to present Morris uh, with a little something. Uh, not only Morris, um, but Nick Obradovic. And uh, now you, you know Morris as our social media coordinator. You probably haven't seen a lot of Nick. Uh, Nick actually is extremely critical to the production of Darkwood Brew because he's in the tech room. He's the, the manager of the tech room in the back, so he makes, makes sure all the technology, which is actually pretty substantial, works. And it happens to be uh, their birthdays in the, just in the least couple of days here. And so we have a little something for you both. Thank oh, you. Oh, you can put that there for me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> They each have a five-minute speech prepared, so... I don't. <laughs> no. I do not. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for your service here and your blessing to us all and many more years of, of lively life. And uh, uh, during August, while I was away, actually there were two other birthdays in the Darkwood Brew community in our band, Carlos Figueroa, our drummer, and uh, Steve Gomez, who's not here tonight, who is oftentimes plays bass for us. It was their birthday, too. We figured, you know, this is the band, so probably... Um, Cake wouldn't um, wouldn't be uh, their cup of tea, so to speak. So we have uh, present this to you uh, a little. Thank you. <laughs> we couldn't find any wild goose, so we found wild turkey instead. <laughs> 
All right, birthday boy, uh, what kind of results did you find uh, online? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, okay. Took me out of my uh, routine. <laughs> You're a bit too flustered. <laughs> yeah, huh? flustered here. Real quick, we'll do a refresh. And the um, verse is verse 21, it looks like. No, I'm sorry, verse 19. Verse 19. Verse 19 with 43% by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you were dust, and to dust you shall return. All right, 19. How about in the coffee house? Uh, what, do, what do we have here? I'm seeing 19. I'm seeing a number of 21s. 20, 23, 23, 22, 20, 20, 20 19. No. I'm seeing a, kind of a split between 19 and 21. So uh, 19 came out in the poll, and 21 is the Lord made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. Well, uh, coming uh, back after the band feature, um, I will probably uh, address um, both of those passages in the, in the Numa reading with a, a brief reflection. And um, we would advise you to simply um, do what the ancients did here and uh, write down that verse that occurred to you. Or you may want to select the one that was chosen by the worldwide community. But whatever verse um, kind of uh, rose within you, um, there may be reasons for that. And much of the wisdom you glean from this episode may ac not actually come from what you see on the screen at all. It may come from your contemplation of that passage during this coming week. So we advise you to write it down and keep it with you and see how uh, that passage communicates with you and your world throughout this coming week. Um, oftentimes the Spirit speaks in mysterious ways uh, like this, in ways uh, that, that involve our intentionality set um, towards the Scripture. So uh, pay attention. Well, after, uh, after uh, the, our musical feature, um, we'll offer a reflection on Genesis uh, chapter 3, verses 19 and 21. Yes, and for our musical feature today, we'd like to play an original composition by Chuck Moronic called Wild Turkey in the House. No, I mean, uh, Jesus in the House. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus in the House. And this is uh, one where the audience can participate. So we're going to have a middle section here where we're going to be able to rap. And the rap goes, Jesus in the house, in the house, in the house now. Jesus in the house, in the house. Jesus in the house, Jesus in, the in, house, house in the house, in the house now. now. Jesus, Jesus in the house, house, in the house. All right, great. So we'll have Ron Cooley on guitar. Mm. Jorge Nila on saxophone. Ricky Williams on bass. And I'm, and I'm Carlos Figueroa. Jesus in the House by Chuck Moronic. Thank you. 
Jesus in the house. Yeah, thanks. Well, coming up, uh, we'll also be inviting you, if you're the first time viewer, um, you may not be aware, but we uh, always um, take communion here and offer communion um, to our, our viewership as well. Um, if that fits within your own um, understanding of the tradition, we invite you to um, gather some bread and wine or juice and crackers or whatever you have on hand, and, and we'll be partaking of that later as a celebration of the common ground we share in Christ. Well, um, we also, uh, we, we promised that we would comment on verses 19 and 21. Uh, I also, we, um, on our internet chat, we promised to answer a question based on what was said uh, this evening, and I want to address that first. A question came in uh, from Jimmy C. asking, uh, so Genesis 1 and 2 weren't written by Moses, huh? Uh, that, there is a tradition that Moses wrote the Torah, the first five uh, books of the Bible, um, but actually nowhere in the Bible is it stated that Moses wrote the five, first five books in the Bible. There are places where it talks about Moses writing down uh, various laws and such, but nowhere is a claim made that he wrote the entire uh, five uh, books of the Bible. And in fact, if he did, um, one of those books talks about Moses' death, so he wrote about his own death. So um, that would be hard for him to write that down probably. No, actually... Um, Modern scholarship has, has done a lot to helping us understand the origins of, of those five books of the Bible, and um, not, it's not all clear, but one thing is clear, they've been able to sort out uh, different voices, and in Gen the chapters that we've been going over, and the chapters we'll be going over during this series, Genesis 1 through 11, there are uh, actually uh, several distinct voices, two of which um, wrote the two creation accounts. One is called the priestly, what the scholars know as the priestly writer, could be a single person or likely a group of people who were, uh, lived during the Babylonian exile, and the other being what uh, scholars call uh, the Yahwist voice, which could have been an individual or a group writing during the 10th century. Now, you can actually, um, using your English Bible, actually ferret out some of these, uh, these two voices um, in uh, the book of Genesis. This is not a precise thing. In English, um, it's not going to be nearly as precise as if you go from the Hebrew. Uh, however, the priestly writer never refers to God as Yahweh until God's name is revealed to Moses in, in Exodus 3. So all the way through Genesis, where the priestly writer's uh, hand can be detected, you only ever find God listed in your English. It appears as God. Uh, the priestly writer calls God Elohim or El. The Yahwist does refer to, uh, to God as Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. So if you look in your English Bible, Oftentimes where it says God, um, that's the, alone, that's the priestly writer's hand. And where it says the Lord God, Lord written in caps oftentimes to indicate it, the underlying is Adonai, um, which is meaning in the Hebrew it's Yahweh. That's kind of complicated, but just take my word for it. <laughs> it says uh, Lord or Lord God, uh, oftentimes that is the, the Yahweh's hand. That's not, again, we're going from English, it's not going to be precise, but you'll get the point. If you see in Genesis 1 um, and Genesis 2 and 3, you'll see that coming out you know, quite boldly. So um, a couple of different voices, actually four or five in all, um, um, are responsible at least for the first uh, five books of the Bible. Now, um, this, the passage of our, the, the focus of our Numa passage was on what we typically call the punishments. Um, now, um, Nowhere is it mentioned that, I mean, they're not being punished, but it's in a sense the, the, the writers attempt to say that, you know, when our focus shifts from uh, the God being the center of our world to obsessing about ourselves being the center, life gets really, really hard, <laughs> sometimes exhausting, sometimes unbearably hard. That's their way of saying that. And it's interesting, a lot of Christians will point to um, the, this male domination piece, that, that the, the Eve, you know, your, your husband shall rule over you. And we say, oh, well, see, you know, males should be higher than females because it says so in the Bible. And yet you look at all those other curses, and they're, A, they're considered curses, and B, um, we don't hesitate to try to overcome the effects of those curses in any other part of it. When the, the, the soil is, is going to produce less um, abundantly, we don't hesitate to try to make the, fo the soil more uh, productive, for instance. When it says that enmity will be created between human beings and animals, well, we don't hesitate to domesticate animals and to try to enter a relationship with them. We, we don't see any problem in doing that until suddenly it's, well... 
you know, men and women. Oh, no, it says in the Bible, the male shall dominate. You know, it's like, well, no, that's, that's a curse that we're supposed to be, uh, you know, that, that, that there is no problem trying to minimize uh, that. But anyway, I don't want to comment further. We could go on for a long time about male-female relationships in Genesis, but that's not what you asked to comment on or what, what arose in our Numa reading anyway. Um, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it uh, you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. So there is that, you know, part of that is that indication that you know, life gets really, really hard. And also that uh, perhaps a suggestion that uh, creativity um, is, is dampened in the world when we become the center of it and not God. And, you know, sh wouldn't that be the case? I mean, when we obsess over our own evaluations, oftentimes that's the worst way to um, enter into creative thought. To enter into creative thought, you have to let something come in from, you know, kind of slantwise, to burst your own boundaries, to take you outside of your box. And, uh, and this constant obsession about right and wrong, uh, righteousness and, and, and unrighteousness, good and evil, um, puts us in this heavily evaluative mode that keeps that box around us and makes it hard, quite frankly, for the spirit to get in a word edgewise. And since the spirit or God's voice is supposed to be the center, um, you know, it's no wonder that when the, sh the, when the focus shifts, um, the world itself is less creative. And yet in response to you know, the life becoming hard, does, God doesn't write us off. God actually has a couple of very specific responses that, that are oftentimes overlooked by Christians. The first response is uh, that God then um, realizes that the, the couple might eat from the tree, the other tree. Remember, there are two trees they're not supposed to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they ate from, but then the other tree, the tree of eternal life. God says, you know, if they eat of that tree, uh, they will live forever. And so he, uh, God uh, takes the couple out of the garden, sets up this gate with a, a cherubim and a flaming sword to make sure they can never go back. And we say, oh boy, yeah, they're getting harsh punishment. They can never return to paradise. No, God is protecting them, protecting us by ensuring that none of our mistakes will have eternal consequences. The, the story is practically screaming at us to understand this. Nothing we can do in this life has eternal consequences. Why do we keep overlooking that? Or are we so obsessed with our own good and evil uh, that, we, that we're no longer looking for God's grace? The other piece that confirms God's grace is that God then makes so skin. In verse 21, make garments of skins for the man and the wife. Part of me wants to say that, you know, if God's going to put up with us obsessing about ourselves all the time, uh, you know, God may consider us much more beautiful naked, but God doesn't want to hear this constant harangue about cellulite. You know, so, uh, you know, so okay, let's get the, get the clothes on them. But <laughs> bottom line is um, the verse clearly shows that God has not given up on, on the human couple, that God does not give up on us. The new reality, the new normal, is that we're going to obsess about ourselves and if our own self-evaluation far more than we should be. That we're going to turn our attention from God to ourselves time and time again, and yet even then, God does not give up. God is there acting in a helpful and caring way. Now, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3, those two creation accounts, they, they show that we are marked by original blessing, and original sin. But they also clearly show that we're defined by neither of these. We're defined by original grace. Original grace. That original grace uh, comes out very strongly in, in this meal that we celebrate at Darkwood Brew, uh, known to Christians as communion. You know, what happened... Uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, at a certain tree in Jerusalem, uh, far surpasses uh, the sin committed at the tree in the Garden of Eden. God set up a party <laughs> uh, for us to, to coronate uh, God's Son as, as sovereign over the earth. And what did we do? Uh, we showed up for that party, all right, but not with party favors, but with hammers and nails. And 
If this life was truly about us, surely in that act, we, it would be all over for us. And yet since God set up this life to be about God and God's goodness, not us and our goodness, that wasn't the end to our story. So we are reminded on a night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread and broke that bread, saying, My friends, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, we're reminded of him taking the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we come to remember Christ's death and celebrate Christ's resurrection And what act of any, what ritual of any could remind us more starkly that God never gives up on us? Not in the tree of the Garden of Eden, not in the tree of Golgotha. God is here for us, to dwell in us. This life is not about you and your goodness or lack thereof. It's about God's goodness, God's worthiness. And that is the best news there is. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We invite you to serve, enjoy, uh, join us in observing the feast.
Well, we're glad you could uh, join us in the dark wood of life uh, at this particular alehouse stop. Uh, we invite you also to come back next week to join us for um, uh, seeing a similar pattern uh, develop throughout uh, Genesis 1 through 11. Next week, we'll be looking at the story of Cain and Abel. And uh, joining us will be a, a Skype guest uh, coming to us live from Germany named Reinhilde Ruprecht. Uh, she uh, received her doctorate in social ethics from Princeton Theological Seminary about the same time I was there, actually. And uh, so she'll be joining us to, um, to really uncover some of these very interesting layers of a very mysterious story uh, in Genesis 4. So uh, hope you can join us next week. And be sure to get on Facebook during the week and continue the conversation and fellowship. Until then, my friends, may the Spirit... The spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord. Go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself. Go beneath you to, be, uh, to uplift you and support you. Go beside you to be your strong companion. And dwell inside you to remind you that you are surely not alone. And you are loved. Loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen. Amen.